The Concorde was a feat of engineering design, but since October 2003, there hasn't been a commercial supersonic flight. Modern jets do fly very close to supersonic speeds though, so we do have to learn about supersonic flight to be able to better understand how modern jets operate today. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to class 20 in the Principles of Flight series. Although supersonic flight may seem like a thing of the past in the commercial aviation industry, there are a few companies out there developing brand new supersonic aircraft, so we may once again be travelling above that speed of sound. That being said, modern jets do travel very close to the speed of sound, so we do have to have an understanding of what happens when we approach the speed of sound and potentially go past it. Now, you can study supersonic aerodynamics for the rest of your life, but we're gonna break this down into three classes where we look at the big differences between subsonic and supersonic airflow, and also what happens when we fly in this weird transitional period between the two, which unfortunately is where most modern jets spend a lot of their time. Supersonic flight in general revolves around the Mach number. The Mach number is basically the ratio of the true airspeed, the speed we're actually flying at, to that local speed of sound. So it's the true airspeed as a proportion of the speed of sound. If we're flying Mach 1, it would mean we're flying at exactly the speed of sound. It's written here as local speed of sound because speed of sound actually changes. You might remember from physics lessons in school that it's around 340 meters per second but it actually varies according to the absolute temperature. Also, the number for 340 meters per second is in meters per second, and in aviation we use knots. We therefore use a different equation when finding out the local speed of sound. We use this one down here. So the local speed of sound, which is sometimes given the symbol A, is 39 times the square root of the temperature in Kelvin. So a quick example of when you would use something like this would be a fantastic question if it came up in the exam. What is the local speed of sound at 30,000 feet in the ISA standard atmosphere? So let's just calculate that. Our formula, LSS, equals 39 times square root Kelvin temperature. Okay, so ISA atmosphere is 15 degrees Celsius at sea level. If we add 273 to that, we'll get the temperature in Kelvin. So at sea level, we have a temperature of 288 degrees Kelvin. That's our starting point. And our lapse rate, our temperature reduction as we go up, is 1.98 degrees per thousand feet. So how much do we reduce in temperature in 30,000 feet? What's well, 30 times 1.98, which equals 59.4 degrees. So 288 minus 59.4 will give us our absolute temperature at 30,000 feet, and that is 228.6 degrees Kelvin at 30,000 feet. Plug the numbers into the equation, and we should get an answer for our local speed of sound. So our local speed of sound, once we've done all that in the calculator, is 589.7 knots. Just remember to convert to Kelvin and you'll be in for a nice easy question if it comes up in your exam. A big part of supersonic aerodynamics is to do with the shock waves and their effect and how they interact with the aircraft whilst they're produced. So we'll quickly look at why they form. So as an object moves through the air, it generates pressure waves as it displaces the air while it moves through it. Some of these waves are the correct frequency to be sound waves and therefore travel outwards in all directions at the local speed of sound for that temperature. As the object accelerates towards the local speed of sound, or Mach 1, it starts to catch up 
with its own waves that it's forming and it forms new waves on top of the old ones and these waves combine to form a large combined wave in front of the object which is known as a bow shock wave. A bow shock wave will form on blunt objects traveling through the air like a cannonball or something else round. The large combined shock wave is very high in pressure and generates a lot of heat using a lot of energy as it does so. So it has to take that energy from somewhere, it takes it from the object and that manifests itself as the object feeling lots of drag due to this bow shock wave. If we sharpen the object instead of having a blunt one, a different type of shockwave is formed, this oblique shockwave. This is because the waves are more angled and the shockwave will attach itself to the object at the leading edge, which means it forms this different, more pointy shape. This more pointy shape is much lower in drag and it's a reason why you see lots of pointy, sharp bits on the supersonic aircraft. While modern commercial jets don't fly supersonic, aka above Mach 1, they do fly pretty close and can cause another third type of shockwave. So if you consider an aerofoil with air flowing over it at Mach 0.8 for instance, this is what you call the Mach free stream or MFS. We know that an aerofoil works by accelerating air over the top surface to make an area of low pressure and that generates lift. This means that the airflow over the upper surface is actually flowing faster than the free stream Mach number. If the aerofoil accelerates the air enough, it can exceed Mach 1. This will happen at the thickest point where the air is getting accelerated the most. When it exceeds Mach 1, it generates what's called a normal shock wave. The speed that this normal shock wave forms at is known as the critical Mach number. So your critical Mach number is defined as the free stream Mach number that results in any local Mach number exceeding Mach 1. So when we reach that critical Mach number, a shock wave, a normal shock wave is formed at the point where the Mach number, the local Mach number reaches one or higher. Directly in front of the shock wave, we have supersonic airflow and the airflow decelerates rapidly through the normal shock wave and drops back down below, all in the space of about a millimeter. And the shock wave itself is very high in pressure and high in temperature, so is a source of drag, much like the oblique and bow shock waves. It's what is known as wave drag. So this energy conversion to heat and pressure results in energy loss from the boundary layer and that means we separate earlier. It's sort of the reverse effect of slats. Slats add energy to the boundary layer through fresh airflow and that delays separation and a normal shock wave draws energy away from that boundary layer and causes earlier separation. If the normal shock wave draws too much energy then it can eventually cause too much air behind it to separate. It separates too early and that leads to insufficient lift being produced or a stall to occur. This is what's known as a high speed stall or a shock stall. It has nothing to do with the angle of attack, it's just a byproduct of the normal shock wave formation. So there are three main types of flight. You have subsonic, transonic and supersonic. If all of the local Mach numbers on the aircraft are below Mach 1, then you are in the subsonic region. If some of the local Mach numbers are above Mach 1, then you're in the transonic region. And if all of the local Mach numbers are above Mach 1, then you're in the supersonic region. 
transonic in particular causes some issues due to this normal shockwave formation we have just talked about. The main issue is that drag. On a graph of the free stream Mach number versus the coefficient of drag, we can see here the value for M crit, our critical Mach number. And shortly after it, the drag rises significantly at a speed known as the drag divergence Mach number. I'm just gonna give it MDD. MDD occurs just after the shock stall and the large increase in drag is caused by the large amount of flow separation behind the shock stall. If you want to fly faster than the drag divergence Mach number, you have to increase the amount of thrust greatly to overcome this massive increase in the coefficient of drag. So practically speaking, MDD is the fastest speed that a modern jet can fly. If this is our maximum speed, then we want an aircraft that has a very high drag divergence speed because that means we're going to fly further in a shorter time, which is better. So the best way for a designer to achieve a higher drag divergence Mach number is to increase the critical Mach number because that's just a function of the thickness and the acceleration of the aerofoil. And then we can also increase the gap between these two. So by creating a thin aerofoil, we essentially accelerate the air less because it has a smaller camber effectively. This means that we reach a higher forward speed before the local Mach number goes above Mach 1. So we're pushing our value for critical Mach number up to about here. Because we're pushing our critical Mach number, that means we're also pushing our drag divergence Mach number and that means we can fly a lot faster. But a thin wing does have its downsides. A lower camber means reduced amount of lift for a start. So we're gonna to have to have some very good flaps and slats and high lift devices to achieve the performance required for takeoff and landing. And also there's gonna be a lot less room for fuel inside the wings. Another solution is to sweep the wings. This means we can achieve a higher value for the R critical Mach number because this relative airflow is acting at an angle to the wing. This means that there's two components. There's one that's acting along the front of the leading edge, and there's one that's acting at 90 degrees, actually like passing over the wing. This component that's actually passing over the wing is the one that's relative for lift production. It's the elements getting accelerated. Because it's only a proportion of our forward airspeed, it means that it's a lot slower in speed and it can be accelerated further before it exceeds our value of Mach 1. So on a graph you can see here that we reach a higher forward speed before we get our drag divergence number. It accelerates up but we actually end up with a higher overall value for drag once we exceed this transonic region. So the disadvantage of sweeping wings is that for any given forward speed, we're losing a component of this airflow to the sideways motion acting parallel to the leading edge. This means we will produce less lift than a straight wing. And this means that when compared to that straight wing, we need to fly faster in order to achieve the same amount of lift. And therefore the stalling speed is higher and that leads to higher speeds needed for takeoff and landing and longer distances for the runways that we require. In addition to the sweep back and the fin wings, you can add little vortex generators and they'll be placed on the upper surface just behind the area where the normal shock stall occurs. And a vortex basically generates a bit more energy into the boundary layer. It's effectively acting as a sort of slat in this way. It's adding more energy into the boundary layer so that that flow separation occurs later and we experience a lot less drag because of it and then we can fly at a higher drag divergence speed. So to summarize then, the Mach number is the true air speed over the local speed of sound. It's a proportion of the local speed of sound that we're traveling at. Mach 1 would mean we're traveling at exactly the local speed of sound. The local speed of sound is dependent on the absolute temperature. We multiply by 39 
and that gives us a value in knots for our local speed of sound. Shock waves and pressure waves are formed when an object catches up with its own sound waves. This happens when we are flying at the local speed of sound, or when the object is moving at the local speed of sound. These waves all pile on top of each other and create what is known as a bow wave in a blunt object or an oblique shock wave in a sharper object. The oblique shock wave is a lot lower in drag, so it is more desirable on high speed aircraft, which is why you see loads of pointy bits on supersonic jets, for instance. The critical Mach number is the free stream Mach number where any local Mach number exceeds Mach 1. Because of the acceleration of the aerofoil, it means the air traveling on the upper surface of the aerofoil travels faster and it can exceed Mach 1 before we're actually traveling at Mach 1 speed. This speed where that happens is the critical Mach number. At that point where we have a local Mach number above Mach 1, we get a normal shockwave and that's formed at the thickest part of the aerofoil. The speed in front of the normal shockwave is above Mach 1 and then very rapidly over the space of about a millimetre it drops to below Mach 1. This normal shockwave draws a lot of energy, energy gets taken away from the boundary layer and can lead to early separation and if it draws too much energy it can lead to too much air separating, the airflow separates way too early and we stall in what's called a shock stall or a high speed stall. The definitions of what subsonic, transonic and supersonic flight are down here. We have no local Mach number exceeding Mach 1, then we're in the subsonic range. If we have some local Mach numbers exceeding Mach 1, we're in the transonic range. And if we have all of the local Mach numbers exceeding Mach 1, then we're in the supersonic range. So when we accelerate through the shock stall, we get to a speed known as the drag divergence Mach number, which is where we get a huge increase in drag, mainly caused by this separation of the airflow. And it'll take a lot of extra thrust to overcome this extra drag that we experience. So this is basically the maximum practical flight speed that we can travel at without doing something fantastic and getting huge engines that only kick in at this speed. It's pretty impractical to fly faster than this. So we want to increase this number as much as possible so we can fly as fast as possible. It's attached to the critical Mach number, so we want to increase critical Mach number, which will push up our drag divergence number as well. The ways to do this are by using a thinner wing. The thinner wing won't accelerate the air as much over the top, so you can get to a higher value for M crit before you get to a local Mach number that's above Mach 1. Thin wings are impractical though because they produce less lift, you've got to use loads of flaps and slats and you can't store that much fuel in the wings. Another solution is to sweep back the wings. This means that your relative airflow hits the sweep of the wing at an angle and only part of the relative airflow travels in the direction that is needed to generate the lift, only that part is accelerated and that means that you travel further forward and that means you can achieve a higher forward speed before that individual component is accelerated beyond Mach 1. You can enhance both of those designs with vortex generators which form little vortices that add back in to the boundary layer and delay the separation.